So is it too much to expect an Egyptian god to understand non-Euclidean geometry? I guess so. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is the throughput. This was a request I wanted to get because it's disappearing from streaming services soon, and uh, it's a movie I've wanted to talk about for a while and had an actual request for. The movie is 1994's Stargate, which was the basis of the later television series that uh, ran for about a decade. The plot of the movie goeth thusly. In the 1920s, a ancient artifact is dug up in a dig in Egypt. Seven years later, this artifact is brought to Dr. Daniel Jackson, kind of a fringe Egyptologist. They have translated the symbols on it and have figured out that this is some kind of artifact that creates something called a stargate. He helps them solve the symbols on it, and the stargate opens a wormhole to a distant planet. They send people through it to investigate what's there and to eventually figure out a way back. They meet people who are descended from ancient Egyptians and figure out that the Stargate was created by an alien who came to Earth 10,000 years earlier and was the god Ra and created much of Egyptian culture and built the pyramids. When the people rebelled against him, they buried the Stargate so that he was trapped on this distant planet. Ra returns, tries to enslave them. There's a rebellion, a lot of fighting. Ra is eventually killed. They return to Earth. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. So at this point, Daniel figures out that the symbols on the cartouche and eventually the Stargate itself are constellations in the sky and that these are these are the way that you program the Stargate in order to navigate to this distant world. The problem with this is that constellations are not constant. Constellations are not physical things. They're just arrangements of stars in the sky that look like things to us. But the stars in a constellation are not related. Sometimes, you know, they're close together in the sky, but some might be hundreds of light years further than other stars. For example, uh, Orion, some of those stars are tens of light years away, some of them are hundreds of light years away. From any other point in the universe, it doesn't look like Orion the Hunter. What's more, over time, those stars move and the constellations will shift. Now in 10,000 years, they wouldn't shift that much. But if you're talking about an ancient civilization that built things that span the entire galaxy, then you're talking hundreds of thousands of years, these constellations would change over time and be kind of useless. And so basing a language system or a navigation system on constellations doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, these constellations were placed in a unique order, forming a map or an address of sorts, seven points to outline a course to a position and um, to find a destination within any three-dimensional space, you need six points determine the exact location. You said you needed seven points. Well, no, six for the destination. But to chart a course, you need a point of origin. The system he outlines here doesn't make a lot of sense. First of all, I mean, you can see from this diagram that of these six coordinates that define where you're going, it's actually three. They're, they're just doubled across the cube. You, in normal Cartesian space, you only need three coordinates to define where you are, X, Y, and Z, length, width, and height. There are different systems like spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, like we use in the galaxy. You define the center of the galaxy, you use distance from the center, and then an angular distance from that, and then height above or below the plane of the galaxy, and you can use that. But you only need three dimensions to define a destination. Now, you could make this a little bit more complicated. You might need very precise uh, location. For example, the coordinate systems we use on the surface of the Earth or in the sky have things divided into hours, minutes, and seconds. It's a sexagesimal system because that's how the Babylonians rolled. We use that to get very precise positions on the Earth or in the sky. You know, having a base 39 system wouldn't be that much from uh, what we have, which is a base 60 system. So that, that wouldn't be too unrealistic. Although if you're talking about a universe spanning transport system, you're gonna need really, really precise coordinates to get to within meters of where you wanna be. The other problem here is the time factor. 
that over time, let's say you have a stargate and you know it's X, Y, Z position from you, you know its location and the distance to it. But over time, the Earth moves, the Sun moves, that constellation moves, that Sun moves, everything is in motion. And so even if you're only, uh, even after a few seconds, your coordinates are gonna be off by kilometers. And if you're talking about something on the far side of the universe, after a few seconds, your positions might be off by thousands of kilometers. You're just gonna appear in empty space. There's another plot hole that people have pointed out, which is that, as we find out, they have figured out what six of the symbols are to unlock the Stargate, and they just don't know what the seventh symbol is. But there's 39 symbols on there. So they could just line up the six symbols and then use process of elimination 39 times until they get the right one. If you had maybe a time factor in there where that seventh symbol changed to account for the motions of stars and the time that has passed, that would kind of make sense. But this the coordinate system he outlines here is kind of nonsensical. Now, I understand that the television series ditched that entirely, and what it posited was a network of stargates throughout the universe, and that the symbols constitute essentially a phone number that you dial to get another stargate. And with 39 symbols and seven combinations, you would have tens of millions of potential combinations that would basically allow you to go anywhere in our galaxy and in many places in the universe. The television series, if what I'm understanding is correctly, I have not watched the television series, uh, does this in a much more rational way. But this way that he describes these seven symbols and how they would create a course, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, there's some interesting science here, followed by a heaping help of bad science. The idea of the Stargate is that it creates a wormhole that connects the Stargate on Earth to a Stargate on a distant planet and allows instant travel between the two. This is one of the many ideas that are used to create faster than light travel. Unlike other ideas though, this actually has a basis in real science. Now I'm not going to sit here and pretend I understand general relativity to the degree that I can talk about wormholes from an informed point of view. But the idea is that you can get space-times distortions that allow you to traverse from one end of the universe to the other. And relativity isn't violated because you basically bypass all the space in between. The example that is often given is of a two-dimensional creature. Imagine you were an ant crawling across this piece of paper. It would take you a long time to get to the other end of the paper. But if you fold the paper over, the ant could jump from one end of the paper to the other without traveling all that distance in between. This is the idea of the wormhole. Uh, this shows up in a wrinkle in time. It shows up in interstellar. It shows up in other things. Sometimes they poke a pen through it to show that, that thing. The idea that you fold space and create these shortcuts. But this is actually based on real science. There are versions of general relativity that predict that we should have wormholes. Jumping from one place in the universe to the other should be possible. The practical problem is that in order to create a large wormhole, large enough for a vehicle or a spaceship or whatever to pass through, you would have to find a way of generating negative energy inside the wormhole to hold it open. So this may just be a theoretical construct, but this is actually, of all the ideas that we have for traveling faster than light, this is the least garbage one. This is the one that is actually based on real uh, scientific theories. Now, after that, however, it really gets bad in a hurry. First of all, the probe tells them where it is in the universe, that it's halfway across the universe. How? 
As we will find out later, it's inside a building. It can't look up and look at the stars and know where it is and transmit that signal back through the wormhole. It also can't send a radio signal off that we could then detect and say, oh, it's in that galaxy, because if it sets off a radio signal, it's going to take millions of years for that signal to get to us because it only travels at the speed of light. They also say it's in this named galaxy, which is halfway across the universe. Very few galaxies actually have names. There's a lot of galaxies out there, billions and billions of them, and we don't name them all. And so this wouldn't be necessarily a named galaxy. And then it gets worse because you have this star map where they show things are, where not only do you manage to fit the entire universe of billions and billions of galaxies onto a piece of glass, but it's two-dimensional. Space is three-dimensional. There are galaxies in every direction. And so you would need like some holographic sphere if you wanted to display this. So this is absolute nonsense. And to me, completely unnecessary. Just saying it's on a distant world that it has gone somewhere across the universe should be sufficient. Now you could actually do some way of figuring out where you are in the nearby universe if you were clever. One of the things we did when we sent out the Voyager probes was we attached a gold record and it has this symbol. This symbol measures the lo relative location of the nearest quasars to our location in our galaxy. And so it is basically a map to where you would find Earth. If you were to go to a distant planet in the nearby universe, our galaxy or one of the nearby galaxies, you could use that same system. You could look for quasars, which are millions or billions of light years away, and use those to align yourself and figure out where you are on the, on the, in the galaxy. And so there are ways to do this, but this, this scene is just absolute nonsense. Yahweh Mahate, Yanat Can't make it out. Sounds familiar. Now, this is one of the aspects of the movie I really like. I take kind of a dim view of universal translators or aliens all speaking English. I understand why we do it. People don't like to read subtitles. It would bogs down a movie if you get uh, wrapped up in that. But I do like where they can't understand the language right away. There's also someone did their homework here. These people are the descendants of ancient Egyptians that Ra brought through the portal, and they have been living on this planet for the 10,000 years since the Stargate was uh, buried and cut off. They are speaking ancient Egyptian, but uh, Daniel doesn't recognize it right away. We don't know what ancient Egyptian sounded like. It hasn't been spoken in thousands of years. Even its daughter languages haven't been spoken in a long time. And what's interesting here is he says it's kind of like Berber. Berber is one of those languages that many people think is descended from ancient Egyptians and shares similarities. Now, later on in the movie, this uh, wife basically shows him some symbols and speaks the words and he begins to understand and realizes that it's basically like the Berber language that he knows, just with different vowels and, and uh, slightly different vocabulary. Now, there would have been a lot more divergence over 10,000 years between these two languages, so there's a little bit of artistic license here. But I really like the idea that they are speaking this ancient Egyptian language that he doesn't know is what it sounds like because he wouldn't, but he does eventually figure out because he knows similar languages. Kind of like if you went back to ancient Rome and you didn't speak Latin, but you spoke Italian, and so you could eventually kind of communicate and figure it out. I noticed that it doesn't also use subtitles for this, them until he understands the language. So this is a really nice touch that I like about the movie uh, with this linguistics, that it, it actually puts some thought into it and gets it right. So a couple of things in this scene. One is Ra has, they have brought this nuclear weapon to destroy the Stargate in case there's anything dangerous to keep it from getting back to Earth. 
And Ra says, well, I've increased the power of this weapon a hundredfold, and I'm going to send it back and destroy your civilization. No. This nuclear weapon is going to be very small and have a very small yield. I mean, it fits in a suitcase. Let's say for just for the sake of laughs, it's uh, 500 kilotons, half a megaton, which would be a very big bomb. Even if you increased it a hundredfold, you're talking about 50 megatons. You're talking about the SAR bomba, an actual bomb that has been actually set off on Earth. And you may have noticed it did not destroy the entire Earth. And what's more, you're beaming it down to an underground chamber. So while it will destroy the Stargate and destroy that facility, it's not going to destroy the Earth. It's like having an underground nuclear test. So it would be, you know, a bad thing, but it wouldn't be a planet-wrecking disaster. And I don't understand the need to exaggerate here. Um, even just sending it back and cutting off humanity's only access to the stars and killing all those people, that's a bad enough thing that I think it creates enough drama. You don't have to have, you know, we're going to destroy your civilization. It's a little bit of an exaggeration there. But I do want to take this opportunity when Ra says, I created your civilization, I'm going to destroy it, to take on this aspect. This plot is based on the ancient aliens idea. The idea that many of the structures that were built by ancient peoples like the pyramids were in fact built by aliens. I take a very dim view of ancient aliens theories. Partly as a scientist, there's no evidence to support this, but mostly I take offense to it. To me, it's kind of, and I hate to say this, kind of bigotry against the past. It's an assumption that ancient peoples were too stupid to build massive, complicated, elegant, beautiful structures on their own. And every time we look at this, we find that our ancestors were far more clever than we give them credit for, that they were capable of far more than we think they were. And things like the pyramids, we can see the, the efforts they made and the way they built up their methods and improve them to the point where they could build something like Giza using just human labor. For a long time, people said, of Easter Island, there must have been aliens or something, because how could they move those big statues? And I saw a video recently where people showed, no, with some patience and enough people and ropes, you can move those statues just fine. Our ancestors were a lot more clever than we give them credit for. They had to be, because they were had many challenges that we don't face, such as disease and so forth. And the fact that you can't think in an hour of a way to do something that they had centuries to figure out is kind of arrogant and insulting. So, I mean, it's a science fiction movie. That's sort of the lead in to the plot. And so I don't get really offended by it. It doesn't bother me in the movie. But I did want to take this opportunity to talk about ancient aliens theories and why I'm not fond of them. Not a civilization destroying explosion, as it turns out. I don't know why science fiction movies always have to have explosions send out these rings of material. Explosions go out in every direction. They don't have rings like that. I think it's because we see rings in things like supernova remnants and so forth, but those are actually spheres of material lit up by the explosion within kind of like a light echo. They're actually spheres, so it doesn't actually blow out rings. So it's, it's one of those little things that kind of annoys me that every science fiction movie does. So overall, what do I think? I'll admit I have a soft spot for this movie. The plot is kind of clunky and has holes the size of matzo balls. The romance doesn't work terribly well. A lot of the dialogue is kind of stilted. And the special effects, while good at the time, have not aged terribly well. On the other hand, it has a really great soundtrack, which I always appreciate in a movie. The cast is very good from top to bottom. I mean, James Spader famously said the script was awful, but he did it for the money. But he's a pro, so he does a fine job. I watch just about anything with Kurt Russell in it. And this was Jay Davidson's second role and really the last role he did because he didn't like the fame that came with acting. I think he does a very good job as Ron. I'm kind of disappointed that uh, he decided to leave acting and do other things. Um, and what's more, the movie has ideas. And I will appreciate a movie that has ideas, even if it executes them poorly, than a movie that has no ideas and executes them perfectly. 
And it's no surprise to me that this turned into a successful TV series. I think the possibilities suggested by the Stargate, the ideas it goes for, the universe it sort of sketches out, the world building it does, really set up nicely uh, for a television series. I have not watched the television series. I hope to get around to it at some point, but I do know a lot of people who really love it, and I'm not surprised because I think uh, this is seems to me to be a good setup for a universe that you could explore quite a bit. As for the science, um, wormholes are a real theory the, of how you could travel across the universe. I really, really like the way they handle the language difference, and I think that's done extremely well. On the other hand, the scene where they send the probe through the tr uh, transporter and the way they describe how the Stargate works are not done very well. So I'll maybe give it a C. Even though I don't like Ancient Aliens, I think of the movies that have positive Ancient Aliens, this is one of the ones that executes it pretty well and uh, has it you know, not to denigrate our ancestors, but more of as a lead in to this bigger universe that the uh, TV series would get to explore. So overall, not a bad way. I last saw this movie about 20 years ago and it was nice to see it again. And that's really kind of why I do this channel to revisit old movies, react to them, see what I think about them now that I have a lot more astronomy under my belt and explain to you some of the concepts that are involved. So hopefully I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll get that bridge project out of the way and uh, get to entertain you with that. If not, it'll be another little short like this. But until then, enjoy movies, enjoy science. I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Please subscribe and like this video, and thank you for watching.